It's March 23rd, 1989. Number one seed Arizona is taking on number four seed UNLV for a spot in the Elite Eight. The Wildcats lead 67 to 65. Arizona guard Kenny Lofton matches up on the Rebels' Anderson Hunt. With under 10 seconds left, Lofton attempts to draw an offensive foul on Hunt. His wild flop goes unnoticed. We'll try for a three and hit it! Hunt with the basket! The Rebels ended Lofton's college basketball career that night, but here's the thing. Starting at guard for a top collegiate program was only a side hustle for Kenny Lofton. His true love was baseball. After this game ends, Kenny will still be a draft pick in the Houston Astros farm system, and he'll post impressive minor league numbers until his major league debut in September 1991. After playing out the rest of 91 with Houston, Lofton was traded to Cleveland. Kenny would later say, I know they gave up on me now, and I'm glad they did. One man's trash is another man's treasure. It would be in Cleveland where Lofton's career would take off. And 15 years later, his career ended with Cleveland. But in between was a 10-team odyssey that took pit stops in a mind-boggling number of massive baseball events that shaped the future of the sport. Lofton can be seen as a baseball version of Forrest Gump, inadvertently sliding into the frame as MLB's late 90s and early to mid-2000s play out. Line right center field! That's gonna roll for a while! Lofton up the middle into center field, a base hit! It is finally over! The longest game in Indians history! Kenny Lofton scoring uh, his 18th consecutive games. That ties the record in the American League. This is the incomparable career of Kenny Lofton. Fly ball, well hit, deep right field. Back is Bell, the ball is up, the ball is gone. Kenny Lofton into the bullpen. The Indians win it 12 to 11. Lofton quickly made a name for himself in Cleveland, setting the franchise record and American League rookie record for stolen bases and earning himself a four-year contract. By 1995, Kenny was receiving MVP votes and was a centerpiece of a dominant Cleveland squad. This could be it. It is. Number 50 for Bell. Six of Cleveland's starters, Lofton included, hit over 300. Kenny's 54 steals were an AL best for the third year in a row, and his 13 triples led all of baseball. He helped Cleveland to their first postseason appearance in 41 years. And the season of dreams has become a reality. Cleveland, you will have an October to remember. Kenny's speed was never more of a factor than in Game 6 of the 1995 ALCS against the Mariners. With Lofton on second and Cleveland up 1-0, Seattle's Dan Wilson allows a passed ball. Knowing he doesn't have a play, Wilson casually jogs to field the ball, but he doesn't see the trailing runner. Kenny Lofton rockets into the picture, catching the Mariners flat-footed. Now here comes Lofton all the way, and he scores! Lofton's base running broke the Mariners' spirits. Cleveland would win Game 6 4-0, clinching the 1995 pennant. And the Cleveland Indians, after a 41-year wait, in the World Series. Against Atlanta in the World Series, Lofton showed off his speed immediately. After reaching on an error in the first, Lofton stole second and third base before scoring on a ground out. He became the first player in baseball history to steal two bases in the first inning of a World Series game. In the ninth, Lofton reached base again with only Cleveland's second hit of the night off Greg Maddox. He ran as Omar Vizquel grounded out, scuttling a potential double play. But Kenny wasn't done. In a moment of baseball madness, Lofton took off for third base. The throw to third sailed wide, allowing Lofton to easily trot home. On the TV broadcast, Al Michaels and Tim McCarver seemed gobsmacked by Lofton's aggression. It's a terrible strategic move, terrible. but he gets away with it. Terrible. That would have been about the most embarrassing ending to a World Series game ever had Lofton been thrown out at third. Despite his perceived lack of fundamentals, Kenny Lofton had personally manufactured both of Cleveland's runs. 
but that was all they would get in a 3-2 Game 1 loss. It was a famously tight and low-scoring World Series, with 5 out of 6 games decided by a run, and no team scoring more than 7 runs in a game. Despite their loaded lineup with Lofton, Albert Bell, Jim Tomey, and Manny Ramirez, Cleveland fell in 6 games to the Big Bad Braves. It was a miserable series for all Cleveland bats, but for Lofton especially, who saw his OPS drop almost 300 points, even after an impressive Game 1. If you ask him though, the Braves had help. In a 2010 interview, Lofton told Cleveland.com, The Glavin and Maddox strike zones were not right. They were getting the calls off the plate and our pitchers weren't. I'm not the only one who says that. You had to deal with it though. You had no other choice. Keep that quote in mind. In 1996, Lofton again had a sparkling year, once again leading the AL in steals and batting over 300. His best highlight, however, came on the defensive end. For all the talking I've done about Kenny's offense, Lofton's defense was spectacular as well. In 1996 would be the fourth consecutive year Kenny won a gold glove. His glove was never more golden than on an August afternoon against Baltimore. The O's BJ Surhoff hits a fly ball to center. Lofton retreats to the track, counts his steps, and then goes into the matrix. Trying to time the jump, and he makes the catch! Oh, oh. Unbelievable! The play of the day! Wow. On the slow motion replay, you can see Kenny brace his foot on the midwall padding. But as he puts his weight on his right leg, the padding slides down. Kenny, inexplicably, doesn't. To this day, I have no idea how Kenny Lofton made this catch. Cleveland sported the best record in baseball and looked primed for another World Series run. But in the ALDS, Baltimore was out for revenge. They took two out of the first three games in a best of five series. In Game 4 in Cleveland, it looked like Lofton and company might live to fight another day. With the lead in the top of the ninth, Lofton dove to try and record the second out on a fly to center. But for once, Kenny's speed came back to bite him as he overran the ball and missed the catch. Two batters later, Baltimore tied the game. Left center field, base hit. This ball game is tied up. Unbelievable. But all wasn't lost. In the bottom of the inning, Lofton came to bat after Baltimore inexplicably let a pop fly drop. A hit from Lofton forces a game five. But instead, Kenny struck out. Baltimore, a team that finished 11 and a half games worse than Cleveland, won the game in extras, taking the series in four games. That would mark the end of Lofton's first stint by the lake. With his contract expiring at the end of the 97 season, Cleveland elected to trade Lofton to the very team that he claimed stole a ring off his finger, Atlanta. In a mega deal, Lofton was sent to the two-time reigning NL champions for David Justice and Marquise Grissom. For Atlanta, it was a salary dump. For Cleveland, a chance to ink a return for a future free agent. For Lofton, it was the first of many, many moves. Though Lofton batted well in Atlanta, with a career-best 333 average, he was also caught stealing 20 times a career worst. The Braves, however, were still a powerhouse, winning 101 games and blazing through Lofton's old friends in Houston in the NLDS. In the NLCS, Atlanta took on a team making its first ever playoff appearance, the Florida Marlins. Florida proved a worthy opponent, splitting the first four games. A game five in Miami would be critical. If Atlanta could steal another game on the road, there was no way they'd let two clinchers slip away at home. What they didn't account for was Florida pitcher Levon Hernandez and home plate umpire Eric Gregg. Curveball and Gregg gives it to him. On the corner. Hernandez get out of it. In what has been called one of the worst umpiring performances in the history of baseball, Hernandez tallied 15 strikeouts off of a generous strike zone. Only two runs at all. Lofton thought he had a walk, dropped the bat, 
That displeased Eric Gregg, showing him up a bit. The 3-2 pitch. Got him! Eric Gregg punches him out on what McGriff thought was ball four. With momentum firmly on their side, the Marlins stunned the Braves in Game 6, clinching a trip to the World Series. Against Atlanta, Lofton felt he was the victim of unfair calls. With Atlanta, there is no question that he was. In the 97-98 offseason, Lofton was one of the top free agents on the market. He signed a lucrative three-year deal to return to Cleveland. While his second stint at the Jake featured more playoff losses, none were as gut-wrenching as the previous failures. But Lofton still found a way to insert himself into history. On the night of August 5, 2001, Cleveland hosted the Seattle Mariners. Seattle was well on its way toward a record-breaking 116-win season. And they played like it early on, opening up a massive 14-2 lead in the top of the fifth inning. Baseball Reference placed Seattle's win expectancy at 100%. Yeah, that's right, 100%. Cleveland didn't even have math on their side. Not even seven Cleveland runs in the 7th and 8th, plus two more in the ninth, could drive the win expectancy below 94%. That is, until Kenny singled to load the bases. A swing and a line drive, base hit to left! Cordero stops at third, Lofton comes through! How about that? Enter Omar Vizquel. The runners go! Down the line! It's headed into the corner! One run is in! And it goes through! They have tied the game! This down to third! It's 14 to 14! Unbelievable! Two innings later, Lofton once again singled to get on base. After another hit moved him to second, Kinney Speed came through one more time. Lofton around third! He's going to score the game winner! McLemore throw the slide! Not in time! Cleveland became just the third team in MLB history to win a game in which they trailed by 12. Kenny Lofton scored the tying and winning runs. After 2001, Lofton left Cleveland and signed with the White Sox. Lofton called the decision an easy one, but his love for the South Side couldn't even last a full season. Three days before the trade deadline, Chicago dealt him to the San Francisco Giants, who were in the midst of a pennant chase. With Lofton installed at the leadoff spot, the Giants took off, going 37-19 and in the season's home stretch to clinch the National League wildcard. San Francisco took care of Lofton's old pals in Atlanta in the NLDS before taking on St. Louis for a trip to the World Series. San Francisco won three of the first four games but found themselves trailing in Game 5, not at all wanting to return to St. Louis for a sixth contest. In the bottom of the eighth, Lofton singled to center and moved to third on a single and hit by pitch. That brought up the most dangerous hitter in baseball, Barry Bonds. As a pitcher, if there's one situation you want to stay away from facing the Giants, you're looking at it right now. The NL MVP swung first pitch, nearly hitting it out of Pac Bell Park. But the loud out was enough to drive Lofton home to tie the game. The next inning, Lofton found himself in the spotlight again, this time with the bat in his hands, two men on and two out. Tony La Russa turned to left-handed pitcher Steve Klein. Lofton's manager Dusty Baker considered pinch hitting a right-handed batter, but Dusty's thoughts were interrupted by his three-and-a-half-year-old son Darren, who said, if Kenny gets one more hit, we win. Baker let Lofton hit. Like Bonds, Kenny swung at the first pitch. That one to right field. Is it going to be the ball game? Up with it. Play coming through. The throw to the plate. The Giants win the pennant. The Giants win the pennant. Oh, 
The walk-off single was Lofton's third hit of the night and his fourth time on base. His unparalleled ability to create havoc from the leadoff spot had him appearing in the World Series for the second time in his career. The Giants and the Anaheim Angels split the first four games. The two teams were on their way to setting a World Series record for offensive output, buoyed in part by an explosion from Giants bats in Game 5. The contest was a laugher, ending 16-4 in favor of San Francisco. But its most notable moment, and perhaps the image of this series, came after a net bat from, who else, our guy Kenny. With runners on second and third and San Francisco up 8-4, Lofton ripped a drive in the right center, a 2-RBI triple. But the play could have turned tragic had it not been for JT Snow, who was scoring from third. After Lofton's hit, Kenny's biggest fan, Darren Baker, acting as bat boy, ran out to collect his bat. Darren couldn't see Snow barreling toward home plate, but luckily, Snow slowed up enough to pick up Darren before he could get hurt. The Giants' victory put them up three games to two. Heading back to Anaheim, Kenny Lofton was one win away from his first world championship. With the title within reach, the Giants jumped in front in game six before Lofton's base running began to dominate. Kenny doubled to the deepest part of the park, stole third easily, and scored on a wild pitch. 3-0 Giants. After a Bonds home run began its flight toward Nevada, Kenny singled, stole a base on a pitch out, and then went to third on the throw. A Jeff Kent single drove him in to up the lead to 5-0. Lofton's game-changing speed had manufactured two San Francisco runs. The Giants stood three innings away from a title. After two straight hits from Anaheim, Dusty Baker pulled starter Russ Ortiz. Ortiz was nearing 100 pitches, but it was still a quick hook for a starter up five. In came reliever Felix Rodriguez to face Anaheim's Scott Spezio. On the eighth pitch of the at-bat, Spezio changed the entire series. The 3-2 pitch is belted to right field. Back on it goes Sanders at the wall. He can't get it! Home run! The Giants were still up too, but they were reeling. The next inning, Anaheim's Darren Erstad led off with another home run. Two straight hits put Angels on second and third with nobody out for Anaheim's best hitter, Troy Gloss. Nan delivers and it's belted! Left field! In the gap! It's in there for a double! Here comes Figgins! Here comes Anderson! The Angels take the lead! 6-5! Gloss's double was hammered, and hindsight is 2020, of course, but statistics showed that by 2002, Barry Bonds' fielding was a liability. Could Kenny Lofton have made that play? Probably not. But I wish this ball had been hit to center, so I could see him try. Anaheim forced a seventh game. Swung on and missed! He struck him out with a high fastball! San Francisco scored first in Game 7, but Anaheim responded just as quickly off Giants starter Levon Hernandez. Yep, same one. The 4-1 Angels lead held all the way into the ninth. But after a single and a walk, San Francisco brought the tying run to the plate. Who represented the Giants' last hope? Come on, you know the answer by now. But Kenny didn't have any tricks up his sleeve this time. Driven into right center field, Erstad says he has it. The Angels, world champions! Lofton bore the rare distinction of being the last at-bat in the League Championship Series and the World Series in the same season. To my knowledge, he is the only player in baseball history to accomplish this. Quite the honor. I think he'd rather have the ring, though. In 2003, Lofton once again played for two teams. He initially signed a contract with the Pirates before moving in another trade deadline deal this time to the Chicago Cubs. Lofton was reunited with Dusty Baker and thrown into another pennant chase. Over the season's last two months, Lofton turned back the clock, batting 327, 50 points higher than his average with Pittsburgh, and stealing 12 bases. And on September 27th, against Lofton's former team no less, the Cubs clinched their first division title in 14 years. Double play ball! Central. 
For the third time in his career, Lofton faced the big bad Braves in a playoff series, and Kenny still hadn't forgotten about 1995. In a 3-2 NLDS victory over Atlanta, Lofton led the team in steals and tied for second in hits. Upset complete, Chicago moved on to the NLCS. You've waited 95 years, Chicago. It's time to celebrate. The Chicago Cubs advance to the National League Championship Series. The Florida Marlins were back in the playoffs again for the first time since their 97 title run and looked to play spoiler in Kenny's season for the second time. After dropping Game 1, the Cubs ripped off three straight wins, with Lofton the engine at leadoff. In a Game 2 blowout, Lofton batted 4 for 5 with two RBIs, a run scored, and a stolen base. Kenny went 4 for 9 in Games 3 and 4 to raise his postseason average to a ridiculous 385. But with the opportunity to close out Florida in Game 5, the bats went silent. Like all but two of his teammates, Lofton was held hitless against a red-hot Josh Beckett, and Chicago fell 4 to nothing. Now for the short. Cub fans have waited 58 years to get to the World Series. They will wait 48 more hours to have a chance again. But the Cubs had the luxury of boarding a plane for O'Hare and having two more opportunities, this time at the friendly confines of Wrigley Field, to win the NL pennant. What could possibly go wrong? Lofton was up to his old tricks in Game 6, leading off the bottom of the first with a single and scoring on a Sammy Sosa double. one to nothing Cubs. Though the bats quieted down after that, it looked to be enough as the Marlins couldn't touch Mark Pryor. Entering the top of the eighth, Chicago led 3 to nothing, though Kenny hadn't been on base since the first inning. If you're a baseball fan, you know what's about to happen, and how unfair it is to Kenny. You know that Kenny is hardly at fault for anything that transpires in this inning. But this is a part of the story. Baseball history being made, and Kenny Lofton, for better or worse, being right in front of it. That's a fair ball down the left field line off the bat of the air. He'll make the turn and post into second base with a one-out double. Again in the air, down the left field line. A long reaching into the stands and couldn't get it, and it's lit with a fan. close to fan interference right there. And that's a Cub fan who tried to make that catch. Why? And it's ball four to Castillo. The pitch gets away from Baco and advancing on to third is Pierre. Into left field, a base hit by Rodriguez. He is delivered again. Pierre scores to make it a three to one ball game. The tying run is aboard and the go ahead run is coming to the plate. Ball in the hole is short and bobbled by Gonzalez, and everybody's safe. Hammered down the left field line, and the game will be tied up. Scoring is Castillo, scoring is Rodriguez. It's a 3 3 game as the frustration ends for Derek Lee. What a turn of events! Five straight hitters reach. The Marlins have tied the game prior out of the game. In the air, right field. Plenty deep enough, you would assume, to get Cabrera home. So to the catch. The throw will come to the plate, and the Marlins have taken a 4-3 lead. That ball hammered into left center field. On the run, Alou. On the run is Lofton, and it's off the ivy. Three runs are going to score on a double by Mordecai. A seven-run Florida eighth inning. In a scene reminiscent of Shakespeare, the Cubs collapsed on themselves with stunning speed. Blame could be passed among many Cubs, but Lofton wasn't one of them. And yet, like the rest of his teammates, he lost Game 6, 8-3. Kenny made the last out because, of course. Game 7 was more of the same. Lofton was held in check again, going 0 for 4. A Marlins rally to take the lead in the fifth took the win that was left completely out of the ballpark. In a stunning comeback, Florida had won three straight games to clinch the NL pennant. It would be their last playoff appearance for 17 years.
At this point, no one could blame Kenny for ring chasing. So that's exactly what he did, signing a two-year contract with the Yankees, who were coming off a loss in the World Series to those same Marlins. Lofton's deal was part of a busy offseason in the Bronx, as the Yankees brought in Gary Sheffield and Alex Rodriguez to complement an already powerful lineup. On paper, this was perhaps Lofton's best team yet. Kenny only appeared in 83 regular season games for New York and posted a career low in stolen bases. But the highlight of the season came when Lofton recorded his 2000th career hit. As if it was meant to be, he reached the milestone in Cleveland, where he was greeted with a long-standing ovation. And Kenny acknowledging taking off the hat. Tell you what, he had some tremendous years here in Cleveland and really deserved that round of applause. That's great to see. The Yankees won 101 games in 2004 and bulldozed their way past the Twins into the ALCS. Against the rival Red Sox, New York didn't slow down at all. In Game 1, a home run from Kenny helped power the Yankees to a 10-7 win. After another New York victory in Game 2, Lofton was quoted in the New York Times as saying, My ultimate goal is for me to try to win a championship. I'm at a point in my career, I've been here for 13 years and gotten close. This is an opportunity for me to have a chance at it again. Lofton was even closer after a Game 3 laugher put New York ahead in the series three games to none. In the history of Major League Baseball, no team had ever lost a seven-game series after leading 3-0. The Yankees, always keen on making history, proceeded to do just that, losing four consecutive games to their arch rivals and watching them celebrate the pennant in Yankee Stadium. Lofton received precisely zero at-bats in games four through six. He was one of the only Yankees to provide offense in a Game 7 blowout loss, notching an RBI single and a stolen base. Would the series have gone differently with Lofton playing an everyday role? He wouldn't get a chance to see a do-over, as Lofton was traded to Philadelphia that offseason. Kenny wasn't shy expressing his displeasure with his time in the Bronx, saying, Everybody in New York understood I wanted to play. I just wanted an opportunity to perform. I didn't feel as much a part of the team. In Philadelphia, Lofton's numbers went back to form. A home run on opening day off old friend Levon Hernandez contributed to an average of 335, his best since 1994. The Phillies hadn't made the playoffs since 1993, but suddenly found themselves in a wildcard race with the Astros. An early September home series against Houston would prove vital. In the first game, Philadelphia trailed 4-2 in the ninth, when Lofton singled with one out, then advanced on a throwing error. After advancing to third on a ground out, Kinney scored on a wild pitch, his speed once again manufacturing runs from nowhere. The Phillies eventually put runners on second and third, but a strikeout ended the game, the tying run just 90 feet away. Game 2 was no less dramatic. With the Astros batting in the ninth and the game tied at 1, Philadelphia called on shutdown closer Billy Wagner. Wagner was having one of the best seasons of his career, and would end 2005 with a 1.51 ERA, a career low. But against his former team, Wagner crumbled, walking Lance Berkman before allowing pinch runner Eric Bruntlett to steal second and third. A single drove in the go-ahead run. Houston took the second game 2-1. to one. If games 1 and 2 were emotional roller coasters, game 3 was shut down by the Roller Coaster Safety Commission for throwing all the riders off of a 90-foot long corkscrew. After Bobby Abreu crushed a game-tying home run in the bottom of the 8th, Two walks sandwiched around a double loaded the bases. Shane Victorino singled to give Philadelphia a 6-5 lead, a lead that could have been bigger had Houston not thrown out the seventh run at home plate. Wagner was once again called into the game, this time looking to notch a save. He retired the first two batters on five pitches before a ground ball to third appeared to end the game. But an error kept the inning going, 
and wouldn't you know it, after a single put two men on, Craig Biggio went deep. Catapult in Houston in front, 8-6. The Astros swept the series from Philadelphia, going from a half game behind in the wildcard race to two and a half in front in the span of three days. Billy Wagner only lost three games in the entire 2005 season. Two of those losses came in back-to-back -back nights. Lofton and the Phillies missed the playoffs. His contract up, Lofton was once again on the move, signing a deal with the Los Angeles Dodgers for the 2006 season. Kenny's time in Hollywood saw him steal 32 bases, his most since 1998. But his most notable achievement was simply being on the field for one of the most remarkable comebacks of the season. On the night of September 18th, LA entered the bottom of the ninth trailing the San Diego Padres 9-5. San Diego sent out reliever John Atkins, who to that point had only given up one home run the entire season. LA made it three in the blink of an eye as Jeff Kent and JD Drew went back to back. And another drive to deep right center, and that is gone. Whoa, was that hit? So now it is 9 7. The game now within two runs, San Diego called on future Hall of Fame closer Trevor Hoffman to shut the door. Instead, Hoffman swung the door wide open while also knocking a hole in the wall with the doorknob, as Russell Martin and Marlon Anderson went deep on Hoffman's first two pitches. And another drive into high right center at the wall, running, watching it go out, believe it or not. Four consecutive home runs, and the Dodgers have tied it up again. The Padres took a 10-9 lead in the 10th but the Dodgers only needed two batters to win the game on a Nomar Garciaparra walk-off bomb. And a high fly ball to left field. It is a way out and gone. The Dodgers win it 11 to 10. Oh, unbelievable. Who was on base? Yep, our guy Kenny. In December of 2006, Kenny would sign a one-year deal with the Texas Rangers. He tied the immortal Todd Zeely from most teams played for by a non-pitcher. That is the most notable stat from his time in Texas, but fortunately Lofton was traded midseason to a more successful team in what would be his final major league season. Kenny must have been overjoyed at the news. The Jake was calling him home. Kenny Lofton was back in Cleveland. He looked like the Kenny Lofton of old in his first game back at the Jake, collecting three hits, one on a bunt that went about 15 feet. Though the sluggers of old were gone, Cleveland was still in a pennant race and ended 2007 tied for the best record in baseball at 96 and 66. In an ALDS against the Yankees that probably had just a little more spice to it for Kenny, he was masterful, batting 375 across four games, including a three hit, four RBI performance in game one. Oh yeah, and he stole a base too. Cleveland dispatched New York three games to one before facing the other 96-win team in baseball in the ALCS, the Red Sox. Cleveland earned a split in Boston before returning home for game three, and in the bottom of the second, facing Boston star rookie Daisuke Matsuzaka, Kenny turned back the clock again. Swung in and belted, deep right center field, this ball is... Lofton's two-run shot proved to be the difference in a 4-2 win. Cleveland doubled down with a 7-3 win in Game 4, and Lofton was once again a game away from another World Series appearance. But with a chance to clinch at home, familiar foe Josh Beckett shut down Cleveland's bats to force the series back to Fenway Park. Cleveland barely put up a fight in a Game 6 blowout, but came back ready for a winner-take-all Game 7. After cutting a 3-0 deficit down to 3-2, Lofton reached second on an error in the seventh. With Lofton's speed, a single would almost surely tie the game. The next batter, Franklin Gutierrez, did just that, grounding one down the third baseline. But as Lofton motored toward home, 
third base coach Joel Skinner inexplicably held up the stop sign. He stopped, and it's first and third, one out. What is that all about? Lofton's baseball instincts kicked in before he could help himself, and he slowed up, before looking at Skinner in exasperation. Skinner's call may have been in response to Gutierrez's single hitting the wall that juts out nearly to the left field foul line. But with an aging Manny Ramirez in left, Lofton could have easily scored on the play. His speed had been his calling card his entire career, and now it had been taken away from him. Lofton's look towards Skinner encapsulated his life in baseball. The game-changing talent, held up by forces outside his control. The frustration at being so close to glory before being stopped by mind-numbing circumstances. Boston turned a double play to end the inning before putting the game out of reach. The Red Sox won the pennant. Ironically enough, Kenny Lofton's last year in baseball may have been his best chance at a title, as the Red Sox easily swept the Colorado Rockies in the World Series. After the 2007 season ended, Lofton became a free agent, but with no contract offers, he was out of baseball for good. A remarkable career came to an end, a career that saw Lofton appear in two World Series, tally over 2,400 hits, steal 622 bases, and appear in six consecutive All-Star games. Don't let all the crazy things that kept him ringless distract you from his enormous talent. Talent that made 11 different teams say, hey, let's give him a shot. But it may be his lack of a championship that turned away enough voters that Kinney only appeared on a Hall of Fame ballot for one year. This is an egregious oversight. But don't take it from me. Take it from Pedro Martinez, one of the best pitchers of his generation. Pedro listed Lofton as one of the five toughest hitters he ever faced. Against Martinez, Lofton batted 345, better than Barry Bonds, Ichiro, or Derek Jeter. His effect on the game was unmistakable, but the universe just got in the way too many times. This was the career of Kenny Lofton. I was toting my pack along the dusty Winnemucca Road. When along came a semi with a high and canvas covered load. If you're going to win a muck mac with me, you can ride. And so I climbed into the cab and then I settled down inside. He asked me if I'd seen a road with so much dust and sand. And I said, listen, I've traveled every road in this here land. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Across the desert, bare man. I breathe the mountain air, man. I travel, I've had my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Reno, Chicago, Fargo, Minnesota, Buffalo, Toronto, Winslow, Sarasota, Wichita, Tulsa, Ottawa, Oklahoma, Tampa, Panama, Mattawa, La Paloma, Bangor, Baltimore, Salvador, Amarillo, Tocopilla, Baron Quilla, and Padilla. I'm a killer. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Across the desert, spare man. I breathe the mountain air, man. Travel, I've had my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Boston, Charleston, Dayton, Louisiana, Washington, Houston, Kingston, Texas, County, Monterey, Faraday, Santa Fe, Tallapoosa, Glen Rock, Black Rock, Little Rock, Oskaloosa, Tennessee, Tennessee, Chicopee, Spirit Lake, Grand Lake, Devil's Lake, Crater Lake, the Beach Lake. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Across the desert, bear man, I breathe the mountain air, man. I've traveled, I've had my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Louisville, Nashville, Knoxville, on Babaka, Shepherdville, Jacksonville, Waterville, Coast, Rocket, Pittsfield, Springfield, Bakersfield, Shreveport, Hackensack, Cadillac, Fond du Lac, Davenport, Idaho, Jellico, Argentina, Diamantina, Pasadena, Catalina, Sea.